Frontend Authority is an online community that promotes the ongoing education of front-end technologies. So uh, PureScript is a typed, pure, and functional programming language that compiles to JavaScript. Uh, it's inspired by Haskell, so if you're familiar with Haskell or if you've ever used Elm, um, it's going to look syntactically very similar. Um, so what do I mean by typed? So in PureScript, all the types are known, to, uh, are known at compile time. Um, they are completely static, but they're also completely optional. The developer can include them if they like, uh, but it's not required because the types uh, can be inferred completely by the compiler. Uh, in practice, though, that's almost never done as far as omitting types. They're almost always included because it just helps you understand how data flows through your application, how functions compose. Uh, so it's also a pure language, which means that all functions in PureScript are pure functions, which means they just map inputs to outputs. Um, no matter how many times you call a function with the same input, you will get the same output. Uh, this means that the functions are referentially transparent, which means you can return a function, or rather you can rip out a function call and just replace it with the return value of that function call and your program works exactly the same. Uh, they also have no side effects. So there's no, uh, there's no date time, there's no HTTP requests, there's no DOM, uh, no logging to the console, anything like that, um, because those types of functions are not referentially transparent. So what good is a language if it's made up entirely of functions that can't really do anything that, other than compute and heat up your computer? Um, so in pure languages, the side effects are encoded into types. In pure script, there is a type that looks very similar to this. Uh, it's called the F type, and it wraps up an effect. Uh, that's the thing in the parentheses there, and then it t has the type of your result, whatever that's going to be, and that's your entire return types from a function that wants to, let's say, get the uh, current date or something like that. So here's a few uh, examples. Um, it's not really important if the if this none of this makes sense to you. I'll kind of run through it. The names are also completely arbitrary; they don't matter either. So the the first example there is a an effect that does some DOM and returns a location. So that would be like doing window.location. Um, the second one, it, the effect is now, and it returns you an instant. We don't necessarily know anything about those, but we can assume that that, that just gives you the current time. And the last one is a little bit more tricky. So it takes a user ID, it's a function that takes a user ID, and then using that user ID, uh, has an AF effect, which stands for asynchronous effect. So in this case, the effect that it has is AJAX, and it gives you, the return type is a user. So we can assume that it's gonna take that user ID, send it up to some server, and give you back a user. Uh, PureScript is a functional programming language that is literally just programming with functions. Um, there's a lot of more, uh, of bigger definitions, a lot more involved definitions, but that's really all it boils down to. Um, there are a lot of languages that you can do that allow you to program in this style. You can do this in JavaScript, you can do this in Ruby, you can do this in Scala, but the key here is in, in PureScript, this is the only way to program. You have your data in one hand, you have your functions in the other, and they, you don't mix the two. Uh, all right, so let's look at some code. So first we'll take a look at functions. This is how a function is defined in PureScript. The first line is the type. Uh, what it says is add is a function that takes two numbers and returns another number. The double colon um, separates the name and the actual type of the function. The parameters are separated by the right facing arrow and the last item in the list there is the return type. So we've got number, number, and number. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh no. That didn't just happen. <laughs> um, okay, so, and this is how you would call that function. Uh, you just give it the name of the function and the arguments, uh, and you just separate them by space. There's no parentheses, no, nothing extra. Uh, this is another example of a function. This is a polymorphic function. It's also a higher order function if you're familiar with map in JavaScript or Ruby or anything, really. Um, this is what this looks like in PureScript. So what it's saying is, the first argument is a function that goes from some type A to some type B. Uh, the next argument is a list of A's or an array of A's. 
and what you get out is an array of Bs. Um, now, the, the A's and the B's there, the lowercase, they are type variables. We don't know what the type is and we don't really care. Um, the, another important thing to note is that A and B can be different types, but they don't have to be different types. So you could, the A and B could be an integer and a string, or rather a string, yeah, an integer and a string. You want to two string all of your integers or something, I don't know. Um, they could also just be integer and integer. They could be exactly the same. Uh, here's how we deal with data types or how we define data types in PureScript. There's a couple different ways. Um, this is a type I'm calling RGB. Uh, it's got three possible values, red or green or blue. The pipe in between all of the values means or. So this is, uh, we call this a sum or a union type and it's basically like an enum in other languages. Except that these types are more powerful. This is another example of, uh, of uh, a sum type. This is a type called action. But its two values are you can either add a user and with that you'll get a user object or user type, that's what that second argument there is. Um, or you can have update name and you'll get a string with that. So in an enum you would just have just red, green, or blue. In this case, you would have some more data that comes along with it. Uh, this final example is how we might define a user. So we have a user, and we know that a user comes along with a string and a number in order to construct one. Uh, we don't know what the string represents. We don't know what the number represents. Uh, we just know that we need them in order to make one. Um, in order to get a little bit more context, PureScript has something called records, uh, which are basically just like object literals in JavaScript. Um, so in this case we say, uh, I've got this thing, I'm going to call it a user, and it's a record with a name that is a string and an age that is a number. Um, one thing to note here is that we're actually creating what's called a type alias. It's not actually a new type. It's just a different way to call existing things. Um, what this is basically saying is, you're telling the compiler, I'm going to call records that have names that are strings and ages that are numbers. I'm going to call that a user. But it is not a new thing. It is still just a record. So you could create an alias. Um, let's call it, we just want to call it name. And you could, yeah, you could alias string as name. If you had a function that took in names, what it's really doing is just taking in any string. It's just that you, the developer, know that, it, that you're calling it name, but it's just for you. It has no extra compile time benefits whatsoever. But you can get some added compile time benefits with something called a new type. Um, so a new type is just a way to wrap an existing type. So what we're doing here is we're creating a new type, we're calling it name, and all we're really doing is just wrapping a string. Uh, the, same is the, the same is true with age, we're really just wrapping a number, and with user we're really just wrapping a record. But these are distinct as far as the compiler is concerned. So if you had a function that took a name, you couldn't then pass it any random string you wanted. You'd have to wrap that string in a name first. So conceivably you would have some sort of function that knew how to construct names correctly. Um, one, of the benefit, uh, one of the benefits of new types is that there's no overhead involved. To the runtime, they are exactly the same as the type that they wrap. It's all compile time benefit. It's all benefit for the, for the developer. Um, they also allow us to write uh, new instances for type classes of existing types. Type classes is a thing that we'll get to in a second. Basically, it's a way that you define um, shared behavior for a type. So you might have some behavior that's already defined by the, by the language for how a string acts under equality, let's say. If you wrapped it in a new type, like name, you could then define how names act under equality separate from how a string would act under equality, even though it is still a string at runtime. So we've got some pattern matching. Um, pattern matching just basically allows us to define functions for different uh, values that are input, right? So we've got our, R our RGB type. We're defining definitions for each possible input, R, G, and B, and just returning some string, row A, G, or BIV, depending on if you send an R, G, or B. Uh, here's another example. So in this case, we're going to create a uh, user account type. You're either a guest or you're an authenticated user with some name. Um, and we're going to greet that user. 
So if we define greet user for a guest and we just put out the string you want to create an account and we define greet user for, greet user for an authenticated user and we say welcome back and then we concatenate their name and that operator that you see there is uh, concatenation. Um, one thing to note about pattern matches is that they have to be exhaustive. Um, otherwise you have to explicitly call out that your function is partial and doesn't handle all possible inputs. Um, <clears throat> so you can either do that by just listing out every single possible one that you want to match on like we did with the RGB or you can use a catch all. So here in this function is it one, we're going to match on the literal value of one. If you pass it a one, you'll get a true. Then we're going to use a catch all which is that underscore that says any other value you send me because doing this for every single integer would be ridiculous. Every other integer you send me, I'm going to, uh, to return false. Uh, fancy types. So um, fancy types, uh, if, you're, if you know Elm at all or have done any Elm, uh, it's a term used to kind of uh, describe some of, the, some of the types that are in languages like Haskell or PureScript. Things like uh, monoids, functors, monads. The other two are a little more foreign, but most people have heard of monads, I think. Um, so what we're really describing here, what people are really talking about are type classes. Um, which is something that Elm doesn't have. So each one of these is just a type class. And a type class is just a way to abstract out common functionality. So if you're familiar with C Sharp or Java, they have interfaces. I think in C++ they're called templates, right? Um, it's the same basic idea. The reason I think that they have a reputation for being fancy or scary uh, is because they're all, they tend to be a lot more abstract. These ones in particular are much more abstract than the types of interfaces you would generally see in a C-sharp project. Um, but they don't have to be, and they not, they're not all really, really abstract. For example, this is the type class or interface used to define equality. So you can create an instance of, or you can, you can basically implement this type class for your data type, and you say how it acts when you want to, when you compare two things for equality. All right, so that's all the pure script stuff. So we'll move on to Pux. So Pux from the website, Pux is a pure script interface to React, similar to the Elm architecture. It's a simple pattern for modular nested components that make them easy to test, refactor, debug, making simple web applications straightforward, yada, yada, yada. So if you don't know what the Elm architecture is, what is the Elm architecture? It is basically the same definition. A uh, simple pattern for architecting web apps makes them easy uh, to test, modular, makes them modular, code reuse, so on. Um, basically what that does is it, the pattern is that it breaks your components into three pieces. Um, you have your model or state, which just represents the state of, your, of that component. Um, you have an update function, which will take some action, whether it be user or some other action from your program and the current state and we'll get you a new state and then you have a view function that takes your state and knows how to render it, okay? Um, anybody who's used Redux, uh, the Elm architecture was kind of an inspiration for Redux, so that might seem kind of familiar to you. So uh, here's a quick example. So um, this is a, a counter application. So it's got two buttons. Um, you press one, the counter goes up, press the other, the counter goes down. So first we define the actions that the user can take. You can either increment something or you can decrement something. That's the action that you can, those are the actions that you can do. And then we have our state. So we created an alias. We're just gonna say that integers, we're gonna call them state from now on in this application. Uh, and we're gonna call, create an initial state of zero. So our counter starts at zero. We have our update function, which takes an action and a state and returns another state. So in the case that it increments it, we're gonna add one to the state. In the case that it decrements it, we're gonna subtract one from the state. We're not gonna check negative numbers or anything like that. And then we have a view function, which takes a state and returns um, HTML. Uh, it uses React, so it's you know, virtual DOM, whatever. Uh, so it returns HTML um, that can perform the actions that we have described. So that's why you see the type of HTML action as a return. That action is our specific action, increment or decrement. 
Um, Pux provides you a DSL for constructing HTML. So each element type is basically a function that takes two arguments, a list of attributes, and a list of child um, elements. Uh, so in this case, what we've got is a div, an h1 that says counter, uh, a button that will fire off the increment action uh, and has the text increment. Sorry, this goes a little that way. There we go. Um, a span that shows the current state uh, and a decrement button. Cool. So I can show you if I'm good with computers, which I am not, how that, uh, what that actually looks like, right? So here's a simple example. We can go up a couple or down a couple? Yeah, down a couple. So we'll go up a couple. So that's basically the application that we've got. Uh, one of the nice things, if, you're, if you have done Redux, then you might have seen the Redux dev tools, or if you've seen Elm, you've seen the time traveling, time traveling debugger. This is the same idea as the Pux dev tool. So you can see all of the different thing, all the different actions that I've done up here, how many there are, and you can step back in time. Uh, I want to make sure I get the right one here. So you can see that the, the UI gets updated as I step back and reapply, or go back in time to previous actions. Um, and this is what the entire code for that looks like. Oh no, failure. I can't see anything. Okay. There we go. So we've got um, our, our action at the top, increment and decrement. We've got the state. Basically everything I just described, but it's all in one file. Um, where's my arrow? There it is. So um, if you are interested in checking out these examples that are in that repo link that I sent before, here's another quick one. This is a rock, paper, scissors application. So we define uh, some types for whether or not you threw a rock, paper, scissors, or you have no, nothing you've thrown yet, so that's your hand. Um, here's a, another uh, type class. This is called the show type class. It's basically just how you stringify your type. And you define how you do that. So in this case, if it's a rock, we're just going to return the obvious string for that, an empty return an empty string. Um, we've got a result and how that gets rendered out as a string, our state, which is player one's hand, player two's hand, and the result of comparing those two. The initial state, everything's empty and we have no result. And here are the actions that you can actually do. You can, the user can throw a hand. We're going to generate a random hand, so we need to be able to receive the, uh, basically it's like an event. An event is gonna get fired off that says, I've received a random hand and you need to handle it. And then there's reset, which uh, if you look closely, I didn't actually implement. Um, but that's okay. So this is where things get a little uh, tricky, having to do with side effects. So randomness is a side effect. So usually in update functions, you have an action, a state, and your return state. When you have an effect, you have to wrap all of that in something that Pucks calls the F model. So it wraps your state and your action, lists out the, and lists out the type of uh, effect that you have. This last bit just says, my whole application might have other side effects, and I don't know what they are, but I know what my specific side effect is, and it is randomness. So in the case that a hand gets thrown, we're going to update the state. That's what we're saying right here, uh, by assigning the hand that they, or whatever they picked to the player one hand. Then we've got this list of effects that we're going to do here. Uh, in this case, we're just doing one effect, but if we needed to, we could do multiple effects. Basically what this is doing is saying, get me a random hand. You can kind of ignore that right now. That's uh, kind of neither here nor there. But basically I'm going to say, get me a random hand. It's going to do some effect to get a random hand. I'm going to say, okay, out of that effect, give me the result. And that's what this is. So I'm kind of extracting it and saying, give me the hand. And then I'm going to say, okay, now fire off the action, received random or receive random and give that, uh, give the hand along with it. And this function will then get called again and we'll go down here to receive random. Receive random has no effects, but we've said that our update function could have effects, so we have to, uh, we call this no effects function to kind of wrap it up in the right shape uh, data um, without actually doing anything. Um, we calculate the result, 
and we assign uh, the hand that we got to the player two. The, this is the code for determining a random hand. Basically, it gets a random integer, that's this right here, pulls the random integer out of that effect, and says, okay, in the case of a rock, in one, two, give me rock or papers, and everything else, give me scissors. And this is the comparison code. I think we all know how rock, paper, scissors work. I might not have known how rock, paper, scissors works and got that backwards, but uh, that's cool. And then we've got our view code here. So, um, won't go into too much detail for the sake of time. Oh no, where'd it go? I did, oh man, Macs are so complicated. <laughs> okay, um, so that's the demo. I didn't show you how it actually runs, but you can imagine, you click a button, you click a hand, it generates another hand, and then it tells you if you won or lost. Um, that repo also has another example that does some Ajax. It does a GitHub search the old way, without GraphQL. Um, so it does a repo search, um, and then renders out all the results. So lastly, why would you want to program like this with all of these constraints, um, enforcing pure functions, immutable data, wrapping everything in these types? Why would you want to do that? And for me, the benefit is in testing, um, reliability, and in reasoning about your software. Um, so the first one, testing, is a, probably the simplest, most obvious one. If everything's a pure function, then testing is very simple. There's no mocking you have to do. You just pass in values and inspect what comes out of it. You don't have to worry about if that function is going to go and do something else like a launch missiles or something because it can't. In the cases where it can, it's very explicit in the type signature. Uh, reliability, um, I don't have any apps in production on this, so I'm just kind of, uh, you know, hearsay. But the idea, uh, there's a common saying in Haskell, PureScript, uh, Elm uh, languages like that, that if it compiles, it works, and that's generally because Kind of a pain to get it to compile, um, making sure all the types line up and everything. But once that happens, um, it's very unlikely that you have a bug in that part of your program. You might have a bug because you did some logic wrong, but you still got everything to line up, so it's gonna work the way that you described. Maybe you just described it wrong. Um, there's a, a guy, his name is Richard Feldman. He works at a company called No Red Ink, which is the largest um, production user of Elm which is very similar to this, so I keep bringing it up. But he's, he really likes to bring up the fact that they've been running Elm in production for over a year, and they haven't had a single runtime error in, in that code. So um, for me, that's, that's a huge win. Uh, and the last reason that I like it is, uh, is reasoning. Um, so the best way to describe that is with an example. So what can we say about this, what this function does? Um, it could do a lot of things, right? We know it takes an action, we know it takes a state. Maybe it just returns that same state and doesn't actually do anything, right? There, it could do wrong things, but we know for sure that it's not going to do anything other than take an action and a state and return another state, right? It's, there's no additional arguments hiding around somewhere, there's no globals, um, it's not gonna log to the console, it's not gonna make HTTP requests. Um, we know that just by looking at the type, so even if we don't know exactly what it does, this at least tells us what it doesn't do, uh, which is huge. Uh, if you had some error um, that had to do with side effects, you can immediately weed out a bunch of functions just by looking at the types. Um, but we can go further, um, and you can actually, there's, there are ways by making functions more abstract, by introducing more polymorphism, that allow you to really figure out what a, function, what a function possibly could do. Maybe not exactly what it does, but really um, just whittle it down to, okay, it, it probably does, or it can only do this one or two things, um, aside from like, like halting, or not, like just freezing and, and dying or mishandling undefined, right? If you ex take away those possible things, there's usually only one or two uh, function definitions that make sense. Um, that's kind of outside the scope of this talk, but it is something that you can do. Um, so when we constrain ourselves to pure functions and static types and build effects into our type system, there's really a lot more that we can understand about our code just by looking at the types and not by looking at the actual implementation details.
Uh, so here, here are some uh, resources. So at Strange Loop this year and at React Rally, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Trotter gave this exact talk, probably better, um, uh, called Pure Script and Pucks, the safer way to react. Um, I didn't know when I agreed to do this that he had done that, but <laughs> shout out to Michael Trotter. Um, there's the Pure Script website. There's a book called Pure Script by Example that you can get on LeanPub uh, for free. Uh, you can also read it there for free, but you can download a copy free if you wanted. Um, that will step you through the language. Uh, Pux has a Git book, walks you through uh, simple examples, and it has full API documentation. Uh, we have, um, if you really want to get into this type of programming, probably the best resource is Haskell book, and almost everything that you learn in that book you can transfer over to PureScript. There's a couple of syntactic differences, but for the most part, everything translates, and it is uh, by far the best introduction to it. I'm not just, not, I'm not just saying that because I have a sticker. <laughs> um, and then uh, this last one um, is a recent blog post by a man named uh, John DeGoes. Um, it's a bit of a clickbait title, but it, it goes into the idea of um, if you make your functions more polymorphic, you can really restrict what is possible uh, for them to do, and thus you can kind of understand more about what your functions are doing. And that's it. Yeah. Can you just say, okay, here I just want to call this JavaScript because I don't have everything. The, yeah, so the interrupt story here is very similar to TypeScripts. You just say, uh, there is this function and I promise that it is, uh, it has this type. So just be okay with me doing that. Okay. Um, uh, if you've used Elm, Elm has a much more uh, strict interrupt story where you specifically, ha you have these things called ports or you used to have these things called ports where you would explicitly say, like message passing, I'm gonna send you this, this, this is the type of message I can receive, this is the type of message I can send, and that's it. Um, in PureScript, it's, it's much more open, um, but uh, yeah, much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I honestly have not looked. It's a good question, though. Um, to be honest, with what I've used it for, it's been pretty simple data structures, lists. Um, you might have like key value, like maps. Um, but for the most part, it's just mostly been uh, lists and just maybe uh, like a some or a product type or something like that, records or whatever. But I, I honestly don't know. Cool. Right. Thank you. Thank you.